In 2009, a man named Juan Arias passed away in a Bronx hospital. They did what they typically do. They did not know him well. He did not have any family there with him. And so the doctors processed the, the, the death like they normally would, death certificate, uh, did a background search and found a social security number and put it all on that. Then they started filing the necessary forms to say that this man was deceased. What they didn't know was that they filed it under the wrong Juan Arias. It was actually a Juan Antonio Arias that they filed under. Juan Antonio Arias did not know this. He went on with his normal life. And then one day, he went and swiped his credit card, like all of us do, me so ma- too many times probably, and it came up declined. And when they called the bank, the bank said, yes, it's because you're not living anymore that we can't use your credit card. It had come up decline. And so then he realized that not only that, but his health care was now canceled. And all these other areas, credit cards, banks clo- or his bank accounts closed, all because of a misfiling. So what does Juan Antonio Arias do? Well, he contacts the courts, like he normally would. And what would seemingly be a simple process of, hey, I'm not dead, because I'm right here, turned into a long, exaggerated process that took years to rectify. And ultimately, finally, Juan Antonio Arias had to stand before a judge with multiple forms of identification and say, look, I am still breathing. And they said, okay, you are alive, we agree. A court case gone wrong. A reliance on a name. A misidentification. Something that was kind of funny turned into a mess. But as we continue in Stephen's life, we know that Stephen was proclaiming the word of God. Not only that, he was filled with the Spirit, the only non-apostle to be doing miracles at this point. And he's doing these miracles, and he gets pulled in front of the Sanhedrin, or the religious rulers of the age, and he gets put on trial because somebody said that he was speaking heresy. As a matter of fact, not just somebody, but a group of people said that he was speaking heresy that he was blaspheming against the temple, or he was blaspheming, also blaspheming against Moses, which he was doing neither. Misidentity, a court case. He's standing before them now, and as we look through the next few weeks, we're looking through what his defense was, or as I like to put it, lack of defense was, as he's standing before the religious leaders. And as we continue on, and he's setting up this this period of, hey, let's look at the religious leaders of old. Last week we called it a God, that he is redefining God to these religious leaders. He's saying that you have a mistaken identity, and it's not me that you've mistaken, Stephen, but instead you've mistaken the identity of who our God is. And to prove it, I'm going to walk you through the Old Testament and show you how you missed it. And so we're continuing with that today. Last week was Abraham, really the first Israelite before they were called Israelites, called from what we probably think that he was worshiping at at some point multiple gods, was called into the real God, was sent out with his family to start a great nation at a great old age. We're moving on to Joseph, or the great-grandson of Abraham. So read with me. We're in Acts 7, starting in verse 9. It says, the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of all of his troubles. He gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who appointed him ruler over Egypt and over his household. So as we're going through our Old Testament leaders, Stephen brings us to Joseph. But before we get into more of the story of Joseph, let's identify Joseph. Because it seems strange, again, if you put me on trial for, let's say, speeding, because I would never do anything worse, right, church? Amen. Hallelujah. The first thing I would do would not be, well, let me give you an American history, uh, right, when I'm in, on my trial for speeding tickets. Instead, I would tell them how I would never speed because I'm a man of God. Amen. Hallelujah. But instead, what Stephen does is he says, I'm bringing you back 
to the original leaders of our religion. He starts with Abraham, as we just looked at, and now he's in Joseph. So let's talk about who Joseph is. He's the great grandson of Abraham. Abraham has Isaac. And then he has a son named J- Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. And when we see that word patriarch in verse 9, these are the 12 tribes of Israel or the patriarchs of the Jewish faith. So if they say something like this, I am the tribe of Benjamin, these are the 12 people. That is who Benjamin is. They're one of these people. So, J- or so excuse me, Joseph has 11 brothers. And they become the 12 tribes of Israel. So Joseph has this dream that he is ruling over his brothers. Now, I am a little brother, have been my entire life, right? I have an older sister, no under, younger siblings than me. So, of course, yes, I was the favorite child, like every younger child is. Got away with probably a little too much. But I'll tell you what I really enjoyed doing. I enjoyed picking on my older sister. Amen. How many younger kids are in here? Amen. No, some people, Tom's the only one admitting it. I agree with you, Tom. I know you will. And so he he's, he's, has these 11 brothers, and he has a dream where he is ruling over his 11 brothers. Now, let me give you a little bit of advice, church. If you have a dream where you are ruling over a bunch of people, especially if they're brothers, I would like you to keep it to yourself. Because he did not keep it to himself. And he was also... Jacob's favorite child says this in Genesis 37, 3. And as we look at this, the story that I'm going through with Joseph is actually Genesis 37 through 46. It's a lot of coverage. So I'm summing up some of this stuff as we look at this. And so in Genesis 37, 3, it says, Now Israel, or Jacob, of course, like every good Bible story, someone changes names. So Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than his other sons because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a robe of many colors for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the other brothers, they hated him, and they could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. So now they hate Joseph. Joseph then has a dream that he's ruling over his brothers, and like a good brother, he goes and tells them, I had a dream that I was ruling over you. And the brothers did not react well. They did not react so well to the point where they ended up selling Joseph into slavery. They were going to kill him at first, so it's one step down from that. So they sell him into slavery, and the slaves bring him to Egypt, and he becomes the slave of a man named Potiphar. And so he does really well. He does incredibly well with Potiphar, and he ends up being kind of the lead of the household, and the wife of Potiphar accuses him or tries to get him into a relationship, adultery, But Joseph, being a man of God, says no. And so what does Potiphar's wife do? Says that he did it anyway. So Potiphar sends Joseph, a good kid who had a bad dream, sold into slavery, now a slave to this man Potiphar, head of the household, sends him to prison. Joseph's now in prison. And he's doing well there again because God is with him, as we'll look at here. And now he's put in charge of prison, of the prison And then as people start having visions, they come to Joseph because he starts interpreting the visions. And now Pharaoh has a vision, and they go to Joseph, and he interprets it. So he brings it to Pharaoh correctly. So Pharaoh brings him, and now he's in charge of all of Egypt. A man who had a terrible dream, telling his brothers, sold into slavery because they decided not to murder him, is now running the largest country at that point in time. So the dreams that Pharaoh had had to do with the plague. And it was over this time that they, were, they stockpiled food because they knew that there was this terrible plague. Not the, the plagues that we find out later with Moses, but it was a drought and there was this stuff going on where they couldn't grow food. So they, so they store up all this food because Joseph is smart. And at some point in time, as the plague hits, as the drought hits, as the famine hits, Joseph's brothers hear that there's food in Egypt So the people, the brothers that sold him into slavery, go to Egypt to try to buy grain from Joseph. 
Joseph doesn't shows that he's not them, and I'm giving you kind of the summary of what's here. Then finally, Joseph reveals himself to him, and in verse 11 of Acts, again, it says this, Now famine and great suffering came over Egypt and Canaan, and our ancestors could find no food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our ancestors there for the first time. The second time, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Joseph invited his father Jacob and all of his relatives, 75 people in all, and Jacob went down to Egypt. He and our ancestors died there, were carried back, and they were placed in a tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver silver from the brothers of Hamar and Shechem. So why? Why did Stephen bring this up? Why did Stephen bring up Joseph? We kind of got an idea of why he brought up Abraham. Well, the reason that Stephen's bringing up Joseph is because one of the charges against him was that he was blaspheming against the temple. And the Jews believed that the temple was the dwelling place of God. So he was directly blaspheming the house of God where God was. But again, Stephen does not deny himself. He doesn't go in front of him and say, look, I didn't do any of that. Instead, he attempts to correct their definition of God. They put God into a box and said that God lived in the temple alone. And Stephen says, look, you have a misidentification of who God is. If you believe that God is reliant on a place, if you believe that this structure holds God by himself, because God is not reliant on anything that man can make, amen? God worked for Joseph without any walls, God worked for Israel without any walls. Why? Why did he work through Genesis? Well, let's look at a little bit more of Joseph here. In Genesis 39, 3, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw the Lord was with him, and the Lord made everything he did successful. Verse 21, going down, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted favor with the, pers- uh, the prison warden, and the warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority, and he was responsible for everything that was done there. Ver- chapter 41, verse 37, the proposal pleased Pharaoh and all of his servants, and he said to him, can we find anyone like this, a man who has God's spirit in him? So, Mo- or, so the Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made you well known, there is no one, dis- no one as discerning or as wise as you, and you'll be over my house and my people will obey your commands. Only I as king will be greater than you. Why was Joseph used? How was Joseph used? How does he go to, from a man in slavery to a person ruling over Egypt? God was with him. And if God was with Joseph, a lowly man sold into slavery, how could we believe that one building could house him and hold him back. God was working through Joseph. It had nothing to do with a place. God was not reliant on conditions. Colossians 1.16, for everything was created by him in heaven and earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Isaiah 43, 7, everyone who bears my name is created for my glory. I have formed them. Indeed, I have made them. God works for his glory, for his purpose, for his timing, to reveal his will. A building's not going to hold God back. So even the claim, Stephen, you are blaspheming against the temple, holds no merit because God is infinitely bigger than the temple. Romans 8, 18, for I consider, this is Paul speaking, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. Everything works to God's glory. Even this pain, even the suffering, even the slavery that Joseph went through, even the struggles that Joseph went through, even the time of suffering as we will see with the nation of Israel, all works to the glory of God. Stephen's saying we don't have a conditional God, but we have an all-powerful God. Amen, church? He's not a reliant God. 
So today, as we define, redefine God a little bit more through Stephen's sermon, we're looking at how God is not reliant. What God is not reliant on. And I'll tell you this much, he's not reliant on anything. But let's look at two specifics here today. That God is not reliant, one, on a location. Verse 9 in Acts 7. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of his troubles. He gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who appointed him over, a ruler over Egypt and his whole household. As you guys know, we moved here about seven months ago, and it was a big move. Andrea and I had not moved out of Arizona. We had been out of Arizona, don't worry. This isn't our first time out of the state. But we had not moved out of Arizona. And so we were getting ready, and we knew that we were downsizing houses. And so what we decided to do, have you guys seen those pod units? Uh, I think they're like 8 by 10 feet. We said we were going to stick everything in that pod unit, and anything that doesn't fit, we're throwing the rest away. Amen, church? Amen, right? So we do it. We get the pod unit. They drop it off at our house. First thing, you walk out and realize, this is a lot smaller than I originally thought. <laughs> and so we know we're not going to need another one. That is incorrect. And so we start by putting our furniture in, the couch. We throw out all the beds right? We threw out all the chairs. We kept one couch. We threw in a couple other things, maybe the TVs and things like that. And we looked at what we had left. And so we packed all the things that we needed to have left. And then there was still this pile of stuff that we wanted, that we wanted to take with us. But we said, and we had committed, that we're not taking anything else. So we throw it into the garage, and we have a, guy, and we have a couple guys come out with a big trash can, and they dump it all in the trash and take it away. But I remember there was one bin, and it was a big bin, and it was blue. It was a bin I had been keeping with, my, with me for 16 or since I was 16 years old, which is longer than 16 years ago. I had been keeping this bin with me. You guys might know. You guys, some of you might in here have your 16-year-old bin. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? It collects over time. I remember the first college that I got kicked out of. It had all the stuff in there. That's a little side point for you, right? It had all the stuff in there. When I moved to Phoenix, it was collecting more stuff. I didn't know what was in it, but I knew my heart was with it, and I did not want to get rid of it. And so I opened it for the first time in probably 10 years, and I opened it, and I look what's in it, and it's a collection of junk, right? No value to anybody. Old electronics, a couple old papers that I had failed on. Um, that first year in college was not good for me. But I had thought for so long that this stuff defined me. This was my bin. It was before Andrea and I met each other, and I carried it place to place, saying, this is mine. This defines me. And there was a scary point where I go, you know what? This is no longer going to define me. And me, myself, I took it and dumped it in the trash can. And there was this point where I got scared. All of this junk that if you guys looked at it and say, why are you keeping this? That was me going into that bin, right? That was my history going into that bin, but I knew I couldn't take it. And so we throw it away, and then finally when it's gone and the trash can's out, the freeing feeling of this is no longer with me came in. Right? The freedom came with it. See, I thought that defined me, but that does not define me. That little box of junk does not define me. Only Jesus Christ defines us. And the family that, and the family that he blessed me defines me. And the church family that we have, that defines me. The physical does not define us as humans. And the same, even more so, goes for God. A building does not define us our Savior. And the Jews, as at least the ones going against Stephen, believed that God was stored in a temple, that he was confined to a temple. But God is so much bigger than a building. He cannot be stored or held back by anything man-made. Amen, church? Stephen's directly confronted the issue of God only developing in the temple. Let's quickly look at the temple real fast. There are actually two temples to tell you what. I mean, if God cannot be defined by a temple or stored in a temple, we should know this. There were actually two temples. The first one was promised to Solomon, and it was destroyed by the Babylonians around 586 B.C. It was rebuilt after the Babylonian exile, and then it was destroyed at five, or is built in 516 B.C., and then it was eventually destroyed by the Romans only a couple years after this text is written. The temple was promised to Solomon. It's 
In 1 Kings 6, 11, the word of the Lord came to Solomon. As for this temple you are building, if you walk in my statues, observe my ordinances, and keep all my commands by walking in them, I will fulfill my promise to you, which I've made with your father David. I will dwell among the Israelites and not abandon my people Israel. The temple was access to God through a building. But when Jesus came, he redefined what that temple was. He redefined the idea that we needed a building to access God. In John 2, we see Christ have this beautiful image where they're defaming the temple, right? Christ is there and they're seeing him try to sell offerings and he's flipping over the tables and he's mad and he's angry and we see this raw emotion with our Savior. But then he goes on after that in verse 18. So the Jews reply to him, what sign will you show us for doing these things? And in verse 19, Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Blasphemy against the temple? This was blasphemy against the temple. He looked at this and said, destroy this and I will raise it up. And now they were all thinking the building. They were all thinking the building that they were looking at. Verse 20, therefore the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build and you'll raise it up in three days? Verse 21, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. So he raised, when he was, so when he was raised up by the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. Jesus said that access to God was no longer going to be contained in a building, but instead our access to God is through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, church? That we have direct access to God. Why, couldn't, why did we need the temple before? Is because our sin held us back from God. Our sin held us from approaching the throne of our God because it kept us dirty. But through Jesus Christ, our Savior, we now have access to the Creator, to God. God's not relying on a building. And we're not reliant on a building to access God. Amen, church? We have direct access through Jesus Christ. The Son, the Father, the Holy Spirit, all access by what Christ did on that cross. What did he do? How did that happen? Well, Jesus Christ came as what we call the propitiation of our sins. Propitiate, which means to gain or regain the favor or goodwill It says it like this in 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world, because we are born with sin. It's called the common denominator of being a human, that we're born since Adam and Eve's mistake. We've been all born with sin. None of us are worse or better than each in the eyes of the Lord, but we're all just sinful, and it causes death. But Jesus Christ came, to take that death for us, the propitiation to gain or regain favor or goodwill. We regain favor of our God, the favor of our God through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Amen, church? 1 John 4.10, in this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. We're not reliant on a building for God because no building can hold God. No building can fully house our God. And I no longer need a building to access our God. Amen, church? Because our access to God is only found in Jesus Christ. Sin keeps us away from God and the punishment of sin is death. But through Jesus Christ's defeat of death and resurrection on the cross, we are atoned, we are forgiven, and we have direct access to God. So it's not reliant on a location. The second thing is this, that our God is not reliant on a circumstance. Verse 9, the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt, but God was with him. You got a picture of a flower. I did not take this picture. There it is. Beautiful, isn't it? I'm going to kill the name of this flower because I know nothing about any flowers or anything. So I'm sorry, guys. If you, if you know us, you can correct me. The caduple flower is what it's called, right? Does that sound right? It doesn't matter. It's all right. The caduple flower, or nicknamed the flower from heaven, or the queen of the night. 
It's a species of cactus. How many of you guys have heard of this? Anybody? All right, there we go. It's a species of cactus, and it's very special because the majority of people have never seen this flower bloom because the flower only blooms at midnight under the exact circumstances and then only stays bloomed for a couple hours before it ends up dying. It demands specific conditions. In addition to this, the midnight blooming nature of, uh, likely, or excuse me, makes the caputo flowers unlikely to be found by someone. It's beautiful. It's very pleasant smelling. It's also the most expensive flower because of its night, night, uh, lifespan. As a matter of fact, if you cut this flower off, it almost dies instantly in your hand. Incredible, huh? Oftentimes when we think about God, our process of God is if we pray correctly, if we do everything in order, if we read the right scriptures, then under the right conditions, we are going to be able to access our God. We're going to be able to say, okay, God, we did the incantation correctly. Now you're going to go ahead and bless me with what I want. But God is not the caduple flower. He does not come out only on the exact day if the right prayer is said and if we wear the right tunic. God is not bound by circumstance. Let's step away from Stephen for a second and look at Joseph as we look at this a little bit more. Because circumstances are a funny thing, right? Often we're under the wrong assumption that when we start to follow God, that we are going to get the right circumstances. If we believe in Christ as our Lord and Savior, everything is going to be made right. Our debt will go away. The job that we hate will go away. The friends that we shouldn't be around is going to go away, Right? all because we said a prayer on a Sunday morning. No, right? When we follow Christ, when we say, hey, we are going to be followers of Christ, when we ask for his forgiveness, when he comes into our life, we are made a new creation. That's the truth. But that new creation is sent back to the same job, the same family, the same friends, the same bills, the same debt, the same health problems, the same circumstances. He gives us new life. He gives us sustaining joy, but he does not necessarily give us new life circumstances. But God still works everything to his glory. Amen, church? What does that mean? It means that even though the most difficult parts of life, even through the most difficult parts of life, the most difficult conditions, God is working everything for a reason. He's still in control, even on the worst day of your entire life. And he's still pointing in a direction, a, rede- a, re- a direction that leads to redemption. Let's look a little bit deeper at Joseph's circumstance here in Genesis 37. They moved on from here, the man said. I heard them say, and this is one of his brothers speaking, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph set out, or excuse me, Joseph was looking for his brothers, and they found him at Dothan in verse 18. They saw him at the distance, and before he had reached them, they plotted to kill them, kill him. And he said to another, oh, look, here comes that dream expert. They sound like brothers, right? So now, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we can say a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dream. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them, and he said, let's not take his life. Reuben also said to them, don't shed blood. Throw him into the pit of wilderness. Don't lay a hand on him, intending to rescue him and return him to his father. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off Joseph's robe, the robe of many colors that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and without water. They sat down to eat a meal, and when they looked up, there was a caravan of uh, Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Let's stop there. They throw him into a pit to die, and what do they do? They sit down and eat. Wonderful. The camels were carrying an aroma gum, balsam, resin, and going down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what, if we gain, or what do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come on, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him. He is our brother, our own flesh. And the brothers agreed. When the Midianite traders passed by, the brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him to 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who took Joseph to Egypt. This seems like a senseless act of violence, right? All for a dream. All because he has a nice jacket. All because he's the favorite. And me being the favorite in my family, I, I had to ask my sister if she could empathize with that. She doesn't listen to this, don't worry. It's a senseless act of violence. 
But God used this senseless act of violence for his will. Joseph was sold into slavery and wrongly convicted of an affair. He was in prison. He had no rights whatsoever, but God was still present. But still, Joseph's story contributed to the greater narrative of Scripture, the redemption through Jesus Christ. He redeemed his life, and he redeemed his family. They sent the Israelites to Egypt, and although they were forced into slavery because of Joseph being in in Egypt, it led to them getting the law. It led to them going to a desert for 40 years. And what did that 40 years in the desert lead to? Them getting to the promised land. Then they were disobedient and they were kicked out of the promised land. And what did this lead to? It led to the Savior of the world coming through their lineage. Church, God uses every circumstance for his will. Amen? You may be suffering. You may not understand the circumstances. The victim mentality may be taking over, but understand you are still a part of God's will. Even the worst circumstances in your life lead to his glory. Colossians 1, Paul writes in verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am uh, completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. We need to trust. Live in obedience. Push forward in the worst circumstances. Joseph did. Stephen did. And understand that you are living for the glory of God. There is no better circumstance. Right, church? As we finish up and as the band comes up, a long time ago, a couple times, I've introduced Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot. You guys may have heard of her. Her husband went down to a Central, a Central America to a tribe that was the most aggressive tribe in Central America to preach the gospel. He went down there with a plane. It was a ministry plane, and he went down there, and they would land. they drop off supplies, and then they would preach the gospel. And as they were doing this, the husband was in the air, and they landed on the plane. And with hour, within hours, the tribe that he was preaching the gospel to, the tribe that he was helping, murdered him and all the people that were part of the caravan. Murdered all the missionaries. It came back to Elizabeth Elliot what had happened. And with her heart, knowing that all circumstances lead to God's glory, she got into a plane, flew down to that tribe, and converted them all to Christianity. Amen, church? She's written books about this. As a matter of fact, there's a video with her voice on it, and we're going to play that for you right now. It's a promotion for her book, but it gets you kind of her story. I was told that my first husband Jim was missing in Alka Indian country, the Lord brought to my mind some words from the prophet Isaiah, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. I prayed silently, Lord, let not the waters overflow, and he heard me and he answered me. And I cannot say to you, I know exactly what you're going through. But I can say that I know the one who knows. And I've come to see that it's through the deepest suffering that God has taught me the deepest lessons. And if we'll trust him for it, we can come to the unshakable assurance that he's in charge, he has a loving purpose, and he can transform something terrible into something wonderful. Suffering is never for nothing. Elizabeth Elliot says this in that same book, suffering is the irreplaceable medium through which I learn an indispensable truth that God is God. He's not relying on a building. God's not reliant on a perfect circumstance. God is not waiting for everything to be perfect to show up. He's not reliant, but we are. We're called to reliance on him. 
We're called to recognize that we need our Savior. We're called to recognize that we live in a world that is broken. And through this brokenness, through our circumstances, we must be reliant on Him. This is living in God's glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we don't have to do this on our own. We thank you that we can't do it on our own. We thank you that you're a good, good Father. Help us to put it all aside. The circumstances, all of it aside to see your glory. Help us just to be reliant on you for our salvation and for our daily living, Lord. As we're praying, I'm going to ask our prayer counselors to come up. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and today you want that to be. You want him to be your Lord and Savior. Come up and pray with us. Maybe you just have a circumstance that you are struggling to get through. Come and pray with us. Let's be reliant on him together. Lord, we thank you. Help us today to never be reliant on ourselves, but know that we can put everything into you. In your precious and holy and wonderful name, amen.